Hi, I am Per Eriksson. So here we are in Sweden and we are in Stockholm and we are here at this fantastic one Michelin star restaurant Opera Kjellaren. And we're here to meet with the chef, uh, Victor Westerlind, to hear more about his style of creating a new profile on a classical place like Opera Kjellaren. Let's meet Victor and have a closer look at his servings. So Victor, uh, if you were to explain for somebody that never ever tasted your style of food, mm. what would you say? Mm -hmm. That's always a tough question. No, I would say uh, I try to use uh, Nordic ingredients, which uh, inspiration from the whole world, but in a classic French format, but also with a little bit of older Swedish cooking and um, that's that's kind of like the format but I like um, food with a lot of flavor and also have a lot of lightness and freshness and acidity and, and yeah so I try to work with both sides. How did it all start? Why did you get interested in food in the first place? So I have uh, my grandmother worked with food uh, as a teacher, domestic teacher. It was pretty much always there. Uh, decided then uh, that you wanted to be a chef. How did that journey start? I had a couple of friends who, who, were, um, who were going to start culinary school. You know, seemed like a good idea to, to try that. Yeah. So it was, it was pure by chance, actually. So how did then your professional journey start into the restaurants? Where was your first station? I started here in Stockholm in a small uh, summer restaurant. It was called Fleet. It was a restaurant on a boat. And then moving on then, where did you go? Yeah, I worked around and then, and then I got that opportunity to work in a more serious, uh, trendy place called Grill. I stayed there for uh, one and a half year pretty much and then I worked at another place and then I got into my first Michelin star restaurant called F12. I worked with ingredients that I never really worked with before. I stayed there for um, four years almost. Then I moved into catering business actually. So I worked with Pontus and was uh, head chef of his catering business. And then you decided then to move back to restaurants after that? Yes. By chance I, I joined uh, Franz and Lindeberg as it was called. Um, the, the restaurant was uh, renamed itself Franzen. In the beginning it was meant for six months and I ended up doing six years. <laughs> and then you moved on even from there. Eh? So I took the opportunity to become a head chef of a new restaurant called Aira. And then you decided then to move on to one of the most well-known restaurants in the Swedish cooking history, Opera Kjellaren. Why that step? Suddenly uh, this opportunity came along and it, it's one of the restaurants I I was here as a guest 10 years ago. Uh, I always liked it. You can't really say no to these shows. So much traditions and I really like the place and I think that you can do something else with it. Uh, you know, try to get it out more on an international level maybe. Did you have a clear concept when you decided to start? I had a pretty much clear uh, vision. I mean, I, I got the opportunity with this job. Uh, we had our first meeting in January and I started in August. But I made a f my first menu in February. Uh, to be able to create the dishes that you are talking about, where do you find the right produce and products to be able to create this style of cooking? The good thing is that I worked in the city for many, many years and I've come to know the best producers of food in Sweden. And uh, you don't really just stumble across a good product. It's something that you work with for uh, over a long time and especially when it comes to seasons. Many of the top chefs in the world they are focusing on sustainability, uh, nose to tail eating or uh, farm to fork uh, eating. What's your take on that? I want all main producers to be Swedish first and then Nordic second. That's the main products and if they are in season, if they are local, it's, it's, it's a very good step. And then I also like with uh, working with birds or whatever, you try to use the whole bird so you get a more natural flow of it. And then there's uh, lots of steps that you can do. I mean, implement small things along the way. You just need to start somewhere. But a good thing here is that we have, a, we have a big house and we have different activities, so we can always try to use it in some of the other 
restaurants in, in the house. So it's, uh, that's a very good step. So here we are uh, in the wine cellar of Opera Shella, and we're together with Lorenzo here, who's the sommelier uh, with this fantastic wine cellar. Tell me the story about this fantastic place. Well, it's, it's uh, as you can see here, it's one of the oldest and more important wine cellar, I would, th I would say, in the northern part of Europe, and for sure one of the most important in uh, Sweden. How many bottles can we find here in the wine cellar? So mainly the, our wine cellar is composed by more than 2,500 different labels. Victor has created a new image for this traditional Opera Shella. Uh, and your task is to find the right wine for the right food. How do you go about to create a, a tasting menu of wine for his dishes. For us and for Upra Shellaland has been always a really important part to have always the best experience uh, talking about wine and together with the, with the food. The new start with, uh, with Victor has been always more funny to find the best uh, pairing. As you know, uh, many of the top restaurants around in the world uh, are constantly finding new techniques, cooking techniques. What's your idea on that? Do you use the traditional way or the French way, as you said before, or do you find the new ways of cooking as well? I work in a classic French, but I never really learned it properly. I always learned the other way around. <laughs> okay. So I have a much more modern approach to it. In general, I like to complicate things. <laughs> OK. What do you mean by that? <laughs> no, I like to do things harder. <laughs> I like to work a lot with the food. Whenever I go to a restaurant, I, uh, sometimes I like to have these experiences that when you get your uh, plate of food or, you know, your main course or whatever it is, I can have a feeling that it's, it's very worked. They have worked with this a lot. They have given it a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously it should feel more natural, but, you know, you can add surprises, you can add different textures, you can add a lot of techniques. And it's, a, it's a very basic super easy move that you do different technique in different dishes and if you match different ingredients with different techniques you get a very versatile menu and no dishes are like similar to each other. What kind of menus do you have here? Do you have a la carte menus or you have a tasting menus or you have both? We have um, a la carte and tasting menu. My, I have one tasting menu, but it comes in two sizes. So you can have the bigger menu, you can have a smaller menu. So the big menu is around um, eight servings, or eight courses. And the, the smaller one is six. So it's around uh, 14, 15 servings, but we call it eight courses. Mm -hmm. And the rest are surprise dishes. But also people are looking more and more for this 360 degree experience. The menu or the food is one thing and then the design and architecture and what happens in the restaurants is another thing. What's your idea on this? I mean, obviously it's, it's uh, super important. I mean, I work in one of the best dining rooms in the whole world, so I mean, it's a fairly good start there. You know, just people who has never been here can just sit with their champagne and just look at the ceiling for 15 minutes and just enjoy the whole place. So it's, it, for me, it helps out to have a very good, uh, beautiful dining room. Always a lot easier if people are impressed before the food comes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You've got a fantastic new launch. I think that the meal should be around two to three hours when you sit down and eat. So, but I personally, I like to, to, uh, to start somewhere else with you know, cocktails or champagne or some canapes. And just, what we do is that you start there and then you also get your um, champagne and menu. So you order the food there. And whenever you're ready, you just sit down and then you are served within a few minutes. It helps out so you can stay longer in the restaurant because you move around and also you can Sometimes we move guests back there for, for coffee in the lounge as well. If you look ahead a bit into the future, into the crystal ball, what do we see? I'm going to do even less dishes, but I'm going to do more servings, I think, and more servings in the beginning. Maybe I'm going to do the smaller menu, even smaller, so you get a different variety. We have new guests that has never been here, or we have guests who are not so used to fine dining. We have a new audience with 
guests who are really uh, into fine dining, and we have uh, regulars here who have been going here for 40 years or 50 years. Uh, they know how it was here in the 60s. We also have uh, quite a lot of numbers of seats. We have around 50 in the dining room, and with the private rooms, we have 70. And that's why we need to offer different menu options as well, because you have different customers. Do you think that there is something that we could call uh, a taste of Sweden? I think so, maybe. I mean, it's, 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 it's very hard for, for me to define, because I, I work with it, I live with it. It's always easier for people from the outside to define what's Swedish or not Swedish or whatever it is. But uh, I suppose it is, but uh, it's always hard to define for me. If you were to give an advice to a young person that wants to become a chef like yourself, what would you say? Stay in a restaurant for a long time and learn everything.